are watching Property TV. Hello and a warm welcome to Property Summits, where you're sure to pick up bags of top tips on how to improve or expand your property business. I'm Emma Birchley and on hand as ever is our team of hugely knowledgeable experts. First off, we have Nicholas Walwick, an investor and developer who makes the most of his expertise in his role as CEO of the world's largest international property forum, providing advice on how to make money through property. Also with me is Richard Bush, who turned a personal interest in peer-to-peer -peer lending into a professional passion, co-founding the property crowdfunding platform Crowdlords. Tony Gimple also joins me, a man with a direct and no-nonsense approach when delivering advice to buy-to-let landlords, investors and developers, whether that's on tax, accountancy or succession planning. With us too is Paul Mahoney, best-selling author and serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of Nova Financial Group, providing property investment advice with a particular focus on the buy-to-let sector. And our new addition, property investor, YouTuber and mentor Ranjan Bhattacharya, a man full of top tips on how to succeed in property after three decades in the business. Finally, completing our lineup, John Howard, a man who's seen it all before, having bought and sold a staggering 3,500 houses, apartments and developments. Lovely to see you, gentlemen. Thank you. Again. Yeah. Right. Now, permitted development rights. Tell us about those and tell us, are they being used in the way they were intended, Nicholas? I'll try not to go off on a massive rant, Emma. Um, <laughs> but permitted development essentially is most of us that have done any property would have heard of by now. It's the ability to change the use of a property um, through a much cut down version of the planning process. Um, there's a number of things they look at, but they're generally a lot easier to get through than a traditional planning application. You wouldn't perhaps have to have the Section 106 or social housing contributions, so it makes it a cheaper way of developing. Um, and it opens up disused buildings to recycle them back into the market. Um, my big bugbear with it is recent changes have not only opened up the permitted development, but it's also, um, you know, as councils have got more familiar with the process, they're also locking it down more and more. Um, and the things that they look at are getting tighter and tighter. And I think, you know, not only the number of things they look at, but they're getting more savvy to it, unfortunately. Uh, for us as developers, you know, we like to, you know, find the loophole and build something that's completely legal, but you know, make that extra margin by um, you know, cutting up the space in a certain way to maximize its value and, and create some quality accommodation. Um, and, and as much as that's um, all well and good, councils are getting more savvy to it and they are making it a lot harder for us to maximize the use of a number of buildings. But why would they do that? Because surely it's in their best interest not to have an empty building in their town. I think it's all about balance. You know, I think what's happened in the last few years as PD's got more established and last year in, um, I think it was August 2021, they brought in um, you know, a revision of those PD rights, bringing in um, a Class E and various amendments, you know, lots and lots of amendments. It's quite tricky to get your head around. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, it's now down to a lot more factors than it used to be, firstly, and that's where you need to get the right consultants on board to kind of help you navigate the tricky rivers of PD that have got more and more complex. And uh, why would they do it is um, essentially they don't want the bad guys, the bad developers over developing buildings. That would be my view as the main reason they want to, you know, so they, they write the legislation, they bring in the, the rules for the, for the people that ruin it for everyone. That, that's my and view. And so um, how far removed is what's happening in towns compared to what the central government's plan was in the outset? Well, I think, you know, you've, you've hit the nail on the head with the question in that, the, the, you know, it doesn't matter what the government bring in in terms of legislation and great ideas to recycle property and stimulate the economy and stimulate the town centres back into use. What's happening on the ground is in a number of, you know, a number of boroughs, a number of local authorities, they're using their own throttling capabilities to throttle those. We've had something called Article 4 that came in quite early in the process in the original PD rules um, that allowed them to blanket an area, you know, on a map, draw a line around where they removed those permitted development rights. That was unfortunate enough. You can still apply for full planning in those. So again, it's just forcing you down the full planning route, which 
for my mind is, is pointless. Um, and you know, more recently, they're just making it harder and harder with more and more changes. They're adding more conditions to things. PD was supposed to be uh, you know, a planning route that didn't uh, allow conditions to be added to a planning uh, decision notice. Unconditional. Unconditional. And, and they very quickly started adding in conditions, although they weren't supposed to, but you have to do what the council says. So they kind of got away with it. And now they very much can add conditions um, and even things like SAM and SANG payments, which are payments for you know, extra natural green space and all the things that come with um, overburdensome and expensive planning applications is now starting to come in in the permitted development space. A couple of things there, though. The, it is possible to appeal conditions and get those repealed, and those takes a few months to get those done. We've had some very good news on the Article 4. So Article 4, of course, for the viewers, is a mechanism by which councils can say we want an opt-out from a particular PD in our backyard. Now, many of the London councils were quick off the block in applying for these uh, Article 4s, and they got them under emergency powers, but about eight London councils, literally a couple of weeks ago, just got those bounced out. They were rejected by right, okay. the central government seems to uh, want this PD to happen and they uh, the backbone. they're being a bit strict about about um, you know they've got to be a specific reason for them to say not in our backyard yeah yeah well, that's good to hear so, so, so what experiences in, reli in reality have you had with that as people doing property development well we have probably got the one of the most knowledgeable or two most knowledgeable people here on PD in the UK, sitting around here. I'm not one of them. Um, but I've done a number of PD schemes, permissive development schemes over the years. 2012, when it came out for officers to residential, very easy, now becoming more challenging, um, certainly. Uh, and I think the government are very concerned about the amount of uh, objections the councils are making. And, and like you just heard from, from Ranjan, the, the great news about this Article 4, um, that they'd be having, they're being forced to lift them and, and allow uh, PD. Um, but certainly, I mean, Ranjan and, and Nicholas, you do a lot more PD than I do. Um, I'd be just interested to ask you um, sort of specific examples, really, of the pushback you've had from, uh, from, from council. I mean, my understanding is that there's, there's a checklist of criteria. And as long as your consultant's kind of aware of, there are a lot of sites where, where there's gray areas. Yeah. Um, and those, there will be a little bit of a battle in getting yeah. them through the criteria. But focusing on the ones that are slam dunkers, there's just no doubt that PD is applicable to this site, they usually go through. I think what it is, it's, I mean, if you use an example was on, um, I don't mind saying on this show, Property Elevator Live that we did together in Billingsgate. There's a chap on there that brought a site that I've invested in and we're trying to get that deal done. Um, and it's where there's a flood risk mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and actually it got bounced out from that flood risk. So it's about giving the council, you know, a number of mechanisms to bounce something out if they just don't like it. And that's the problem. The more mechanisms they have, they just, they just pull it out and go, there's one. We know there's an easy solution, but we're going to bounce it out anyway. And on that particular deal, that, that lost the other person the deal. We're going to have to work very hard and pay some very high paid consultants and hopefully try and get it through. But it's adding cost, it's adding time, it's adding yes. risk, oh. and that's the real problem. It's not that it, you know, with the right team, you can't necessarily get it through. Was that it was simple, simple and easy and, ch and cheaper, absolutely. yeah. You're absolutely correct. And I think the new PD that's come out in August the 1st, 2021, um, to, to meet those checklists, you have to do a lot more reports. Yeah, yes. Um, and then the thing with the reports, like noise reports, time reports, and all of that, yeah. there's all those mitigation measures that you can put in place yeah. to counteract any concerns that they have. Yeah. The question is whether there's enough juice in the deal to make implementing those mitigation Spot on. measures worthwhile. Yeah. And that's the and issue. And also, if you've got the enthusiasm for it at the end of the day, because it was very simple at one point, 56 yeah. days, you got it, or whatever, now. Or the experience, John. You or used to have to write a yeah. one-off letter covering yeah. letter with yeah, your exactly. architect, yeah. here's what we want to do, it meets these things, and we that's checked how the flood zone, been. it was mm. fine. Now you've got to write five or six, 2,000, 3,000 pound reports, yeah. you know, and-, and, and So it's, it's almost like planning permission, it's which was the original question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is, there, it's, is there a but point? But the, it's not almost like planning permission. You, okay, you do, those, permission. <laughs> you do those reports, but the difference is that there's no wiggle room. There's no subject, yeah. There's no subjectivity by yeah. the council. If you meet the criteria, they can't subject, I mean, you don't have this issue with planning permission where one council rejects an identical scheme, another council accepts it. No, gotcha. That okay. subjectivity yeah. is not there. Yeah. That's the advantage and certainty for developers. Do, do you, you two have done a lot of um, PDR projects. Do, do you ever 
uh, decide that it's better to go for planning than just go for permitted development? No, never. <laughs> and, and, and so why is that? Is, well, is it as Ranjan's just said, there's the, the still the subjectivity <laughs> issue. And, and I think PD still is easier than full planning, isn't it? I mean, it clearly is. Well, you haven't got the social it, housing impact for a start. You haven't got the social housing. You've also got True. dwelling mix. I mean, if you're looking, like we do, we do build to rent schemes. So what does our market want? Typically studios want beds. If you do under planning permission, you want to build 10 flats. They'll say you want a couple of three mix, beds, two mix. beds, one bed. Yeah. I don't have to bother about that. If I can rent all one beds, I can do eight one beds. Yeah. And I can do that under PD. I can't do it under planning. On this topic, the, the mix is key because in smaller sites, like we've yes. got a shop with a couple of uppers, you can't fit a two bed in it, it's not big enough. So you need a small one bed and that's the only thing yes. that can work. So it brings in an element of the commercial market, the smaller commercial stuff that now becomes more viable to develop yes. with the PD. Yes. Actually, whether it's PD or full pl business development or full planning, talk to the council, read the plan, find out what they've done in the past, what they want now, what they want in the future. You know, what's that? People have spoken before, you've know, probably heard this one, but it's, you know, there's a lovely saying about, you know, to keep a cow healthy, you have to milk it every day. We'll do it with soft hands and a straight back. Find out what they want, i.e. the council. Find out what they want, work with them and not against them. Uh, yeah, it's easy you saying that, Tony. Yeah, isn't the point of PD that you don't, doesn't matter don't what they want? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter what their legislation yeah. should be. Uh, uh, whether what it should be, but if they're on side mm. and it meets all the criteria, mm. there's less reason for new yes. years. There's no point being yeah. antagonistic towards well, why, why do you exactly. think, why, why are councils so often painful about this? Well, I think, look, who do you submit your planning application to? You submit it to development control departments. It's not, it should be called development enablement. Yes. But it's development control, yeah. and that's what they want to do. It's a, it's a box, tick, box it's ticking a, exercise, isn't it? And it's often political. Does it tick these boxes, X, Y, and Z? And mm. They look for every possible box. And they? now, of course, they're, they're, they're more employees. savvy about it as well. Whereas in the early yeah, days, exactly. they, they really, really know, probably really knew what they were really doing. Now they're almost, you know, the, yeah. they are the PDR police almost now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's not really fair to say under the old rules they didn't know what they're doing. I think. Under the new rules, it's they've given me the, the criteria. Powers. They've been given more wiggle room or say no room, which is why we need exactly. to do more reports. You are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. So what happens if, for example, you see an office block comes on the market, you think, right, that'd be good, I could turn it into apartments. Under permitted development rights, you might think that'd be easy. But is it now the case that you should think twice? You might have to worry about what the councils are going to do? Well, I think certainly from my personal point of view, you should always, you're, you should always use the professional planning consultant who hopefully you built up a rapport with and you trust. Because ultimately, uh, they will advise you, hopefully correctly, but I always still want to have permission granted prior to actually exchanging contracts. And I've done that on a number of occasions under the PD rights. What happens if more than one person fancies <coughs> that office Well, block? I get it agreed in principle, uh, subject to, well, it may not be subject to anything as far as the, 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 the seller's concerned, because of course, PD rights, technically you can get within 56 days. So I, I crack on very quickly with the application, get it in, and I'm, I'm unlikely to exchange uh, contracts before I have a decision. And when you're dealing with an office block, how different are the costs involved on getting that um, outline decision compared to if I wanted to convert my attic? Well, you pay so much per unit, don't you guys? I mean, that's, I mean you two yeah. do a lot of it more than I do, but I mean, you pay, but it's certainly cheaper than a full planning application. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's all the reports. See, there's a number of reports you need to back it up. You know, you've got to remember the, the member of staff in the council isn't a developer they're not commercial they want to tick a box and say I'm, I'm happy with the flood risk i'm happy with the acoustics mm. happy with the highway situation they're not highways experts so now you need to 
write that report and show them the highways is fine. There's nothing to be concerned about. So it's you tick an, the boxes for they just them want so to tick when they the go boxes, through, you they can go, see yeah, that it's all And there. they read all the reports okay. and, they, and, they, and they, you've given them comfort from third party professionals that everything's in order. I think it's hitting the nail on the head. And that's what, that's what we do with all our planning, our PD submissions. Uh, you do their job for them. What they have in front of them is the criteria for granting prior approval for permitted development um, for an applicable application. And you just show them in your, in your submission that you meet every single um, item in that criteria list. What's the average cost of getting those reports done? For it depends on what it is. What what? I mean, it depends on the type of building. Well, it's like a thousand to five thousand a report. I mean, you can get you know an advanced highways report that has turning circles, parking issues, bike and bin store locations because that takes up some of the communal space that might be used for parking. Um, you might have to do a survey on the movements in and out of the site. You know, it can get quite advanced. I would say highways is probably the most expensive one of the reports needed generally. Stuff like flooding would be quite easy. It's just you generally a flood check. Um, but then if there is a flood issue and you're in a floodplain, to then get it through, you then need a report on is that actually going to be a risk and what are your mitigation measures? So it depends on the building, what, what's needed. And there's sometimes noise, of course, and um, you yeah. know, uh, heritage, because you can do these things in a conservation area as well. But I think the, um, the thing that people need to do is to basically educate themselves on what they can and can't do under PD. People need to have that in, yeah. knowledge inside out, because as an entrepreneur, You've got to look at a site and say, well, what can I do with it? And then f figure out the vision and the, also the numbers and then validate that. I mean, I feel I know permitted development very, very well, but I will not um, commit to a scheme unless I've validated what I want to do with a planning consultant. And I'll be expecting them to go through all the I's and T's and recheck and double check that it, we meet every single criteria. And is it that the same whether you are going for maybe converting an old dentist surgery in the same way as when you're looking at a whole big office yes. block? Yes, yes. Yeah. Rules are the same. Um, similar. Similar. Sure. similar. I mean, it's similar in that there's a checklist of criteria to follow. It might be slightly different, like if it's the dentist surgery, it's slightly different. Um, but that is the difference between permitted development and planning. There's no subject subjectivity. I think some of us, like, I mean, Nick and I, we've both done PD under the old rules that were introduced in 2013, and they were a lot easier. And in some ways, you can say, well, the stuff that they've introduced now is a little bit harder than that, but it's still a lot easier than planning permission. What I would not be able to build a lot of the stuff I've done under planning. But it's the due deal beforehand. But if you're going into the deal, whether it's permitted development, whether it's full planning, you've got to make sure it's going to work for you and for the investor and for the end user and so it has got the path of least resistance and it ticks every single box from your perspective and if it still works and then it fails or for some reason at PD with permitted development or full planning the local authority getting away at least you can actually show you've done all the right things it does meet yes. you know, and you've got a track record of doing it before. I think one of the one of the key things to remember at PD the biggest risk of PD is the things that are not PD. Right, so if you've got an office Good building yeah. that doesn't have enough windows, yeah. you need a planning app for the windows, they'll block the Windows app to stop you implementing the PD. And that's the subtlety, you know, people see lovely buildings and offices and they that's wow, that's got PD, fantastic. And they forget that adding a couple of windows might knock out two flats and the entire viability of the site. But those two windows are what the council will use if they don't like the site to block the whole thing. Was the bigger money to be made in PD before are more people aware of it now and thinking that way and therefore there's more competition for the deals? Oh, may I answer that? Please do. There's someone here, one of the six hmm? of the summits, who has constantly marketed the fact that it's a lot easier and uh, everyone should be doing <laughs> PD. Which, by the way, thank you to that person, Ranjan, for making it harder for the rest of us <laughs> to buy office blocks now to convert into PD into flats. This is about so, honesty, John. I'm well being done. On, that's all about, it's yeah. all about honesty. So <laughs> congratulations. It's all about and helping also, other people, John. And also to Nicholas as well, because he's done similar, to be fair. Um, but uh, joking apart, the, the two of you are probably the one of, the, well, there you are, in my opinion, the most experienced um, PD developers in the UK. And you have a lot of advice and you have a lot of knowledge, but you still, you still ask the planning consultant 
advice, and that's yeah. the key to this. That is the key. You're not to this. arrogant enough to think that you know absolutely no. everything, even check though you probably check. both do. <laughs> we check we also want check. someone's PI insurance on the line if they give us the, <laughs> if they give us the wrong advice. Yeah. Yeah. But also keeping in on mind, that thing yeah. Um, yeah. about the deals not being available, yes. I think it's Thanks about the knowledge. It really is about the knowledge about what you can and can't do with PD because there are a lot of easy stuff that's obvious PD, low hanging fruit, and everyone knows about it. But well, there's plenty now. of stuff yep. that the nuances that people don't know. And I still go back to the, the, the fact that um, I would say nearly 70% of everything that we've bought in the last couple of years have been through auctions and commercial agents, which means they were available in the open market. They weren't direct to vendor or off market or anything like that, which means they were available to everyone else, but they couldn't see the potential that we saw. What were you going to say, Paul? Yeah, just a couple of points. So, so you know, some some office buildings are horrible buildings, and with PA you can't do anything to the outside. Okay, there's lots of really old concrete, you know, not very attractive yeah. buildings whatsoever, and you or need clad. to clad. Or, well, or clad or, or, or not clad, just yeah, just yeah. really un just ugly building. buildings. And are people actually going to want to live there? Is that is that the building you want to turn up home to every day? Well, is is the question? I, I have a good answer to that, and I think it, well, there's two answers to that. One is the council are very unlikely, once you've got your PD approved and potentially started to implement it and they see it's going residential, they're very unlikely to not allow you to improve the look of the building. So that planning app is usually, if it's well prepared, like everything we've been discussing today with good architects, renders and CGI's and all the rest of it, they're very likely to pass that because they, no, they can't stop it going residential. Um, secondly, you know, again, depending on the type of the building, it might be better suited to a different type of tenant. We've talked about displaced people. Um, there's other types of um, tenant that are less picky in terms of the accommodation that they are in. Mm -hmm. And as long as the inside is of a, a quality standard, the look of the building may not matter as much to them. And therefore the model as a developer can still work. But Nicholas, one thing you're, I think you're missing out on, and that is that if it's in a very commercial area, yeah. Although you might be able to do it, doesn't always mean you should. Yes. And Richard Great. here yep. won't fund it for you. Yeah, it's much harder. The to bank lose. won't fund it Agreed, because yeah. it's in a very commercial area and he worries about everything. On that happy <laughs> note, we are out of time, gentlemen. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Emma. Uh, today, that was very, very interesting. Uh, until next time, thanks ever so much. Bye bye.